Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'd like to welcome you all to church this morning. Uh, we do have a couple of prayer requests. Um, we need to remember our country and our communities. Uh, remember Paul and Lou and their family. Uh, keep Miss Pam Mullins in your prayers. She's not here today. Uh, she came down with a cold and um, told me she was going to sit out. Uh, so pray for her. Remember David Agee, my grandpa, as well as my mom. She's here in the nursery. Um, remember uh, Paul's Aunt Minnie. Uh, I don't see her today. She's still feeling under the weather. Uh, keep, keep praying for her. Remember Bobby Hogg. I talked to Melissa Mitchell. She is home, uh, but ask that we continue praying for her. Uh, remember Mike Burnett's mom. Remember Merle's breathing. Uh, the Ivy family, Shelby and Vicki, pray for them. Uh, Chris Mobley, pray for him, still in the hospital. Uh, pray for him. Remember all those out traveling. Uh, remember Justin, he's out there directing traffic in the parking lot. Uh, we are out of parking spaces, so I have him double parking people. So if you have to leave in a hurry and you are blocked in, just come see me. I'll find out whose car it is and get you out. Uh, but that is a good problem to have. Um, remember all the upcoming nursing home ministries at Calvary, all the upcoming ministries of Ca Calvary. Uh, the Christians in Afghanistan, keep praying for them. Remember each other in our unspoken request. Uh, keep the struggling churches in your prayers. Keep the thriving churches in your prayers. And also remember the COVID situation. Um, you know, I, I, I got a message today from a young lady. Um, and I'm not going to go into detail, uh, but this is affecting a lot of people in a lot of different ways. Some people are losing their jobs. Uh, some people are uh, getting sick and in, in the hospital. Some people are over politicizing it and losing their friends. Uh, but a lot of people are losing a lot of things because of this virus, and we need to be in prayer about it. Uh, we need to be praying for those who are scared, and we need to be uh, being there for those people who need us. Uh, don't also don't forget to pray for my uncle Phil and Aunt Lucy. Aunt Lucy did go home. She's with her daughter at her daughter's house. Uh, but pray for that situation. Uh, I told you guys uh, Wednesday uh, that if there's a need, that the church will help out with that need. So far, there is no need. When there is, the church will step in and cook a meal or do whatever we got to do uh, to make sure Uncle Phil and Aunt Lucy are taken care of. Um, let's open up in a word of prayer. And then we can get started. Dave, will you pray for us, sir? Amen. As far as announcements go, uh, there is no PM service tonight. I figure after a good chili cook-off, uh, we need to go home and relax a little bit. Uh, so there is no PM service tonight, but we will be here at eleven. I mean, uh, at seven o'clock on Wednesday. Uh, so make sure you're out for that. Justin's preaching. I don't know where he went to, but Justin's preaching. Um, so come out for that. If you feel led to give, please give in the uh, giving station back there in the back. As you can tell, there's a lot of construction going on out here in the foyer. Uh, Mike's doing all that. Uh, so if you go through that door, you're, you're risking getting dusty. Uh, so just deal with it if you get dusty. If you want to complain, see Mike. He is the complaint department. Um, <laughs> uh, don't forget to download the app. We have a TV app. We also have a phone and tablet app. Download that is for communication, but also Bible studies and different things from that. Uh, remember our life groups that are coming up. Our ladies are meeting on November 20th. Our men are meeting November 11th. Seniors are meeting this Thursday at noon. Uh, and of course, other than this week, because there is no PM service, my life group meets every Sunday night at 6. Don't forget the prayer board back in the back. Write your prayer request on there. Uh, take a picture of it so you can pray for the ch uh, those in the church. Uh, be inviting people to church. Um, the statistics say that most people will come to church if someone besides the pastor invites them. They expect the pastor to invite them. 
What they don't expect is their brother, sister, friend, relative, whatever, to say, hey, would you come to church with me? Uh, so be inviting people to church. Uh, if you're a visitor, please fill out a visitor card. I'm not going to show up at your work unless I work with you. I'm not going to uh, call you and bug you. I just want to be able to pray for you by name, uh, and that's a way for me to do that. Uh, and if you need me to reach out or want me to reach out, put your phone number, email address, all that. But we, the church, would like to give you a gift. Um, so please fill out that visitor card. Our food pantry is up and running. My sign is in. I'm going to be putting it up either this afternoon or tomorrow while the ground's still nice and soft. But this Wednesday, I don't know if anybody's going to show up or not, but this Wednesday does officially start our food pantry here at the church. Um, there's a lot of stuff back there already. Mandy's going to go out on Monday and buy what remaining things we need with the budgeted money that we have for that. Uh, but be in prayer for that. Be in prayer that we, uh, the church, can reach the community and help out where there's a need. Also, there's a uh, our cook-off is today. My slides are all out of whack. You're going to have to bear with me. Uh, our cook-off is today. So there's a couple announcements with the cook-off. Um, is there a lot of chili up back here? It's going to be a good day then, ain't it? So the judges. We're missing a judge. There's only four, so my wife will be the tiebreaker. You know she ain't going to vote for me, so that's fair. <laughs> but we are having a baptism today. Immediately after the baptism, we're going to be dismissed to go over there. The judges will need to get up and go over there. As soon as the baptism happens, my wife will have all the cups and the, the blind taste test will be ready for you guys so you won't know whose it is. That way, no one can accuse me of cheating again. <laughs> but we want everybody to stay. Um, if you didn't bring anything, we don't care. Stay. There's always plenty of food. Stay and eat with us. At the, at the um, back table, there's drinks. You're going to see a whole lot of cups that have the Calvary logo on it. Take your cup home. Just take it home with you. If there's extra cups at the end and you want to take a couple cups home, take a couple cups home. Uh, but take those cups home with you. They're not doing no good sitting in the back pantry here. Um, also, um, just so everybody is aware, um, we are having our fifth Sunday fellowship in January. Uh, that'll be the next time we gather as a church to eat after church. But stay with us today. Eat with us today. Um, even if you didn't bring anything, just stay. And if you don't like chili, stay and eat whatever else is back there. I'm sure there's other stuff, right? Yeah, there's other stuff. So to stay and eat something and, and fellowship with us. Uh, also, uh, did I miss any announcements, Mandy, with that? No? Okay. Uh, November 14th, we're having a youth night. Uh, so if you know teenagers, if you have a teenager, have them here at 6 p.m., November 14th. There's going to be uh, First Baptist of Newtown and Open Door Baptist Church are going to be represented here, uh, maybe even a couple other churches. Uh, so be, pray about that, but also come out to that. Uh, and then here's this announcement. This one was just announced Wednesday, so you've not heard this one if you haven't weren't here Wednesday. Uh, we are doing something a little bit different. Uh, first of all, our Christmas party is December 11th, starting next week. There's going to be a sign-up sheet for the Christmas party so we can have a roundabout number of people coming that's fully catered. No one brings anything except for a dessert. Um, we're going to work out the plans for that, and I'll announce everything next week. But mark your calendars now. December the 11th is our church Christmas party. Uh, all are welcome to that. But December 19th, we are having a community Christmas here at the church. Uh, the church is going to, with the help of uh, my work, uh, the Milford Bus Garage, they have uh, graciously and generously partnered with us to help the community out this Christmas. We live in an area where people decide around Christmas time, do I pay my bills or do I buy my kids gifts? Uh, we don't need that to happen when there's churches, enough churches around here to take care of the community. So Calvary is going to step up and, and the Milford Bus Garage is going to step up and we are going to sponsor 11 families. If you know of a family that needs help, not just someone who wants to budget their money better, someone that needs help with Christmas, come see me, come see Mandy, and let's talk about it. Right now we have six, five, five families already. Some of them are coming from the schools. Some of them are coming from within the church or people that we know within the church. Um, so if you know somebody that genuinely needs help, come see me. Uh, we have to reach out to them. We don't want to overstep our bounds. Some people don't want help. Uh, so we have to do it the right way. 
but reach out to me this week because we want to have everything ready to start buying by next week. What that means for the church is we are going to be collecting money. And I know everybody loves to hear when the pastor says we're going to be collecting money. The reason we're going to be collecting money is to take care of these kids. Uh, no parent should have to decide, do I, am I a month late on rent or do my kids not have Christmas? Now, I know there's kids in the room, so Santa comes regardless, right? Yeah. Santa might come to Calvary that day. You never know. But we need to help these parents out. So that is what we're doing. If you have any questions, come see me. I'll explain it in greater detail uh, when I'm not up here in front of the church because uh, I'm sure you don't want to hear me ramble for 10 minutes about that. Uh, but also, I think that's all of our announcements. Um, so, so the question this week is this. How does the Holy Spirit help us? We talked last week about the Holy Spirit, but the question is, how does the Holy Spirit help us? The answer is found in, in Ephesians 6, 17, and 18. The Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin, comforts us, guides us, gives us spiritual gifts and the desire to obey God, and he enables us to pray and to understand God's word. Here's what it says in the Bible. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication uh, uh, for all saints. I don't think that's the right verse. Uh, but the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit's there to convict us of our sin, comfort us, guide us, give us spiritual gifts, and the desire to obey God. Obviously, I took taking the week off seriously because I didn't put the right verse on the wall. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll make this right next week, and we'll cover two questions next week with the right verse. Uh, but I'm going to get out of the way. Uh, the musicians are going to take over. Knowing that singing is part of worship, everybody stand and let's sing together. Get things. There we go. I hear that's on. All right. All right. Who am I that the highest king would wear? I was lost, but he brought me here, his love for me, oh, his love for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed, I'm a child of God, yes, I has ransomed me, his grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Oh, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free. child of God, yes I am, in my Father's house, there's a place for me, I'm a child of God, yes I am, I am chosen forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free.
There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Raise a heart. presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah my weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me. I'm going to sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're going to hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes. Will arise. Death is defeated. The king is alive. I raise a hallelujah with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the middle of the mystery. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. gonna sing in the middle of the storm louder and louder you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes hope will arise death is defeated the king is alive sing a little presence of my enemies sing a little louder louder than the unbelief I sing a little louder my weapon is a melody fight for me. I raise a hallelujah. 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 We've 
gathered in your name, calling out to you. Your glory like a fire, awakening desire will burn our hearts with truth. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. Open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. This time we're going to dismiss the kids. I uh, I'm not preaching this week. In case you're wondering why I'm just standing here, um, I uh, take one week off a year. And this is that one week where I do nothing. Didn't even cut my hair until last night for a whole week. I debated on letting it grow, and Mandy said it didn't look good. So I had to cut it. She didn't say that, really. Um, but I have had the great pleasure, the privilege, of having a pastor for my dad. Earlier this week, we had my wife's grandpa, Junior Pittman, preach for us. He was my pastor. He still is my pastor. And today we're going to have who God gave me as my pastor my entire life, uh, my dad, come preach for us. Uh, Wednesday, I said from junior, I learned consistency and to do your best. From my dad, I learned how to love the unlovable. So I'm going to let him come and teach us something. Thank you. There's no greater pleasure than to have that impact on your sons and daughters and grandchildren. I'm glad that you're here today, and I want you to understand that you're not here by accident. Thank you, Dad. You're not here by accident today. You're not here by happenstance today, because you're here because God wanted you here today. 
You may think, well, I'm there for the chili cook-off. Well, that's not really it. You are, but you aren't. You may think, well, I'm here because that's what I do every Sunday. I get up, I go to church. And that may be true, but that's not why you're here today, really. You may think, I'm here just to get my spouse off my tail end about going to church with him or her. And that's not it either. You're here because you have been divinely appointed to be here. There's something here that everyone needs to know today. For some of you here today, you're here because you, you, you expect to receive God's blessings on your life. Some are here today because you're seeking a refuge from the world around you. Some are here today because God wants to give you one more chance to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ about salvation for your soul. And someone may be here today because this is your last chance to hear the word of God and to respond to the Holy Spirit as it begins to tug at you. I don't know why you're here today, but I know you're here because God wanted you here. We're going to take one verse, and it's a verse that we've all heard many times. We've heard it preached. We've heard it taught. We've heard it in context. We've heard it out of context. But we're going to take one verse today, and we're going to break it down, or we are going to divide it up into five small blocks, or five small facts. Facts. F-A-C-T-S, facts. I want to make it easy to understand. There are five facts about death maybe you've never considered. But there are five facts about death that every person in this room needs to understand. I don't care if you're a 13, 14, 15 year old teenager or you're a 94 or 95 year old grandma or grandpa, there's, there's five facts about death that everyone in this room needs to understand. They're not difficult. We're really not, you know, climbing the, the heights of, 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 of knowledge, but these are things that we sometimes don't understand. We need to understand. Hopefully, my hope is, my prayer is, that by all of us corporately learning and knowing about these five facts about death will help us to understand and to be prepared for what eventually awaits everyone in this room. What you do with that knowledge is completely up to you. You can say, well, it's just another windbag preaching the same old thing I've heard over and over again for years and years and years, and they keep talking about it, but it ain't never happened yet. But it will. You may think you're, you're immune. You may think you're nine foot tall and bulletproof, but you're not. You may think, I'm going to wait to the very, very end and, and then... As my car is going over the cliff, I'll say, cry out to God, oh, God, save me. But that won't necessarily work. You may have missed your chance. So I say some here today, this may be your very last chance that the Holy Spirit will touch your heart and draw you unto Jesus Christ for your salvation. I want you to turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 9 or, or read the board up here. Let me find it in my own Bible. Again, this is a verse that we all, we've heard this before. What new thing can there be in this? Here's what the Bible says. As it is appointed, as it, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And that just rolls off the tongue for Christians that have been in the, in the walk for a long time. That just rolls off our tongue. And as it is appointed, one man uh, wants to die. To ma but after this, it didn't roll off my tongue so easily, did it? But after this, the judgment. I want to look at the five. I want to break that down into five small sections 
And I want you to understand what it's really saying here. Because it really doesn't look like it. It pretty much states the axiomatic truth of that. The, the something that everybody knows. Everybody knows we die. Everybody knows that. that. So why do we need this verse? It's under, you know, it was appointed unto man to die way back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 19. Now, I don't know if I marked it or not, but I want to read that to you. You don't have to turn here with me, but I just want to read this if this is the right one. Yes. After Adam and Eve had sinned and, and they had confronted God or God confronted them, God tells them in the sweat of, tells Adam, in the sweat of thy face thou eat bread. Till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, and unto dust shalt thou return. God said all the way back in the beginning when it was just one man and one woman, you're going to return back to the ground. I made you because of your sin. Adam, you're going to die. Eve, you too. So we read that. And we say, okay, well, I understand that. It's appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. All right. Okay, got it. Got it, preacher. Move on. Well, I'm going to do that right now. The first fact, the first fact that I want us to understand here is it is appointed. It's appointed. That means you have an appointment at some time, maybe in the future, maybe in the short future, maybe on your way home from church today, you have an appointment that you've got to keep. Because it's appointed. It's appointed. See, death is unavoidable. Think about it. No one gets out of here alive. You say, wait a minute now, preacher. There were examples in the Bible. Yeah, those two guys, they did get out of here alive. You're right. Back in the Old Testament, Enoch and Elijah. You're right. They, they, but you know what? They have to come back during the tribulation period, and they have to die on the streets of Jerusalem and lay there on the ground for days and days and days before God finally reaches down and takes them back up into heaven to be with him. So, yeah, they left but they have to come back. Nobody else has left. You say, wait a minute, preacher. What about these people that said they died on the ark? Pumping that blood, pumping that you're not dead yet. Oh, you looks like you are. You can't talk, you can't move, you can't do anything, but nobody gets out of here alive. So the common knowledge of life is that you are going to die. That's the first fact. See, we have birth control. You can have as many babies as you want, or none if you decide, or four if you want. But we don't have death control. There's nothing you can take that will give you immortality that you can get at the Rexall, or the, I don't even have Rexall anymore, Walgreens, or, or whatever they're called. You can't get that pill because there is no death control. See, it's appointed that you die. I say, preacher, this is a pretty dark subject. Yeah, it is. It is. See, you have one opportunity to prepare for eternity. Understand that. You have one opportunity to prepare for eternity. Well, when is that opportunity? That opportunity is now while you're breathing, while your mind is right, while you can function, you know, you're not brain dead. You have that opportunity right now in this, this whatever, however long your life is, during that period, that's your opportunity to choose salvation. That's now. That's your opportunity to prepare for salvation. So you have to understand, you do have an appointment with death. Now, we've established that fact, right? Everybody understands that? Anybody that doesn't understand it, all right, you, you got it. We, you know, everybody knows it. The second fact that I want to point out is, is the, about death is, is, is for men. It is appointed for men. Yeah. 
well, I didn't give him this, so I, I, it's appointed for men. So we say men. Does that mean you're in trouble and you're in trouble and you and you and you and you and you guys? We're the only ones? No. It's a generic term. God, what he says here, it's appointed. If you really, it's for all mankind. Thank you. There it is. It's for all mankind. So that you and 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 you, and you all of you. It's appointed for man. So God is telling us that mankind, every single one of us, and you're no exception. You may be special in the eyes of your, your husband or your wife. They may worship the ground that you walk on. And God doesn't. So you have an appointment. And it means there's no exceptions. It's appointed to all mankind that they must die. There are no exceptions to this rule. You certainly aren't the exception. You have an appointment with death. Let me share a story with you. I worked with a young guy. At the time, he was probably in his mid-30s. Young, single guy. He was just a good guy at work. I mean, I... Yeah. I would like to include myself into his friends, but not a close friend, but a workmate. But I enjoyed this guy. I liked this guy. His sister graduated from UC, and she was uh, going to be an attorney. She had graduated and gone all the way through that. She's going to. So he's taking her out for a brother and sister, just a congratulatory time together. We're going to go out for a meal. They're stopped at a stoplight down on Beekman Street. Now, if anybody knows anything about Cincinnati and you know anything about Beekman Street, that's not a good place sometimes to stop at night. While he's sitting in the car with his sister, windows down because it's warm, they're talking. Out of the shadows, three guys come out from behind a building, and one pulls out a gun. And he says, get out of the car. I want it. Dion and his sister, they got out of the car. You know, yeah, he had a lot of money invested in this car, but he got out of the car, and, and he said, look, you know, take the car, take money, take whatever you want, just don't hurt us. Two of the guys are climbing in the car. The third guy takes the gun and shoots him down in the street of Cincinnati on Beekman Street. And he died. They had what they wanted. See, Dion had an appointment with death, and he didn't know it was coming. He was going out for a night with his sister. And God had a plan that tonight, tonight, I went to the funeral, and it was so sad. It was so sad. It was down in Avondale where the funeral was. and Just to see the hurt and the pain of this senseless murder of a good guy. You say, well, was he saved? I, I don't know. I know the preacher preached him into heaven, which, by the way, I can't do for you, and neither can the pastor. We can't preach you into heaven. You understand that? We can say flowery things about everything. How you boy, you think that was a great person. But if you die lost, you're still in hell while we're preaching those flowery sermons at your funeral. We can't preach you in. God says you have an appointment, and that appointment is for all men. The third fact about death that you need to know is once I, and as it is appointed, we understand, unto men once to die. You die one time. You have one shot at this. Right now, you 
all mankind, we're in a probationary period right now. We're on probation, and, and sooner or later, we're going to be surveyed by the master. I always hated when they did reviews at work. Hated it, because I was really good at what I did. I was the best. Amen. <laughs> Stay with me. You're part of this. And they would call me in and they would say all these, well, now you did this, and, this, and tell me all these great things. Boy, we're glad you are as, boy, you're as good as strings. And it was that butt that erases everything in front of you. All those glorious things. That's just, you might as well, just give me the bad news, okay? Don't tell me, oh, man, you're a, you're a leader and you're a spokesman and you're an example. But if you could just get here on time once in a while. <laughs> so you have one time pointed unto men, once to die, you die only once, and once means you get no second chance. There is no reincarnation. Forget it. You're not going to come back as a dung beetle and start over. You get one shot at this. You're on probation right now. You get one shot at this, this eternal life thing. You have one time. There's no second chance. There is no redo. Once you die, you die one time. That brings us to the fourth fact. And, it is, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, what? what? After this, well, I've already died. After what? So death is not the end for you. You're not done. You're just dead. We've got, we got a situation here now, don't we? Because I always thought, and this is what people say, I always thought when you're dead, you're dead. That's true. And everybody thinks, well, when you're dead, every song you hear, every poem you read, every gravestone that you go by that has that engraving, they'll say, and now they're looking down here from heaven. No, no, not everybody's going to heaven. And you want to know, and only when it's a, a comedic part of a movie or a story will they say, yeah, well, in a cowboy movie, Old Zeb there, he, he's a good man, died with his boots on, but he's looking down from heaven if that's where he went. Ho, 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 ho. There's nothing funny about that. Everybody's not going to heaven. I don't care what, how great of a church person you are. I don't care if you know every book of the Bible. I don't know if you understand it, understand from Genesis all the way back to where the maps are in the back of your Bible. That does not give you a green light into heaven. For is appointed, oh, here we go again, unto man once to die after, okay, you're doing great, but I'm not keeping up. But after this, the this is after you're dead, then you have, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Death is not the end. Understand, that nanosecond when death creeps into your body, and life slips out. You're in eternity then. You don't go into eternity after the funeral. You don't go into eternity after they've buried you and everybody has walked away from the grave and then somehow the angels come down and, or it doesn't happen. You're, as soon as those eyes close in death, in that moment, you're in eternity. It's your appointment. You die once, and after this, after you've died, 
comes the next step. You know, now, I've seen, and anybody that's close to my age or older, we've been to way too many funerals. I get so tired of it. We've seen so many deaths in our lives. And if you stop and think about it from just a purely human, physical idea, what an awful thing that is to die. Because all of the relationships that you have with people, suddenly they're gone. If you were to die, she's gone. Your family's gone. Your children are gone. You can't reach them. They can't reach you. So immediately, when, when, this, when this soul breaks the bonds that hold us here to earth because of the life that's within us, when that cord breaks and we enter into that eternity, all of these relationships, they're all dropped at once. And then it's at that moment when you open your eyes in eternity that you realize that preacher was right. My probation period's over. There's no other chance. We enter into another realm, another world. You're now in, into eternity. Everything changes when you die. Everything changes. You're gone. Now, to those of us that are born again, I'm okay with that. Okay. So I'm dead. That's what I've been waiting on. We'll say, what, what are you, suicidal? No, I take medicine for that. The truth. But for those of us that have received Christ, we've, we've acknowledged him as the son of God. We've acknowledged him as the, the only one that can remove the, the, the edemic sin that is within us that we're born with. I didn't choose it. It was in there already. Only Christ. When you those of us that have come to the realization that I can't get to heaven on my good works or on my merit or my church attendance or even being baptized. I need Christ. I need the blood of Jesus Christ for my redemption. So for the redeemed, the idea of death, look, we go to a place where this doesn't hurt this doesn't hurt, this doesn't hurt, these don't wear out. We go to a place where no more pain, no more suffering, no more waiting, no more heartbreak, no more, no more wearing out of body parts, no, no more exhaustion. Luca came over, he ran away from home the other night. He told his mommy and daddy he's running away and he wants to come to Nana's house. So he did. He came to our house and he spent the night there. And while we're trying to get him to eat breakfast the next day, he's running around the table trying to get the dog to chase him. And my dog is an old dog, so he doesn't chase anything. The only time he chased him was when Luca had a piece of bacon in his hand. Then he would chase him. And I thought, oh, to have that kind of energy because I'm way too tired for that. But I have a place waiting <laughs> through the blood of Christ that I will have that kind of energy. I'll never grow older. I don't have to worry about death anymore. For the believer, for myself personally, that's a very comforting thought to know that after this, 
because I know what comes after this for me. And that brings us to the fifth and final fact of death. After this, the judgment. Now, understand something. Everybody ever born will face judgment. There are two judgments. For the believer, you're judged by the judge, Jesus Christ. Everybody says, you know, they get this, they, they sell this image of here's God sitting on his throne up there, and you see before him a long white beard, and he's God doesn't judge you. Not God the Father. Jesus, the one that died for you, he judges you. For the redeemed. He judges us not on our sins because we have no sin. You say, but I sin. Yeah, you do, but it doesn't stick. It affects you, but it doesn't stick to you. Because when you get there, it's kind of like Jesus saying, what sin? We torture ourselves with our sin because of our conscience. So we're judged on our works that we did. We're judged on why we went to church, how we acted. You know, did we profess Christ? Did people know who we are and what we stand for? Are we the same here as we are out there? We're judged on our relationship with Jesus Christ. And we're judged on, at that moment, we're judged on our works. But if you're lost, you stand before the same judge that because you're lost, you are now Guilty of nailing him to the cross. And he's your judge. All judge. But after this, the fifth fact, after this, the judgment. So the moment that your eyes close in death, your judgment. You're jumping from the frying pan right into the fire, you might say. And that's precisely what Hebrews 9.27 is telling us. Immediately after death, judgment. Those who die in Christ, or as we say, those that are saved, we should have no fear of death. Because Romans 8.1 tells us that, and I'm using it in, in, in the, uh, not the king's English, but it's, it's the gist is that there is no condemnation who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. You're not going to be condemned because you've accepted Christ somewhere during your probationary period. The conclusion. And yeah, we're going to conclude this. We've carried this as far as we can. The Bible says, fact number one, it is appointed. Death is unavoidable. Fact number two, all men, and you're no exception. Fact number three, you die once. Once to die, you die one time. Fact number four, that's not the end. After this, death is not the end. Now you face fact number five, it's judgment. You know, death, death is the, the, the door to your soul's destiny. Think about that. Death is the door to you, your soul's destiny. You die lost, your destiny is to, for a while to be in hell, Eventually, it'd be thrown into a lake of fire along with the devil and hell and all of that. If you're born again, your destiny is now you get to go home to be with the one that loved you so much that he died on the cross for you. He came for all mankind, and he came for you. These are your five facts that I wanted us to look at today. Musicians, we can go on up. Matt, if you want to come.
Our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this opportunity. It's a rare opportunity to preach to such an attentive crowd. Father, I thank you for that. Lord, I ask that as we talk about the, these facts that we've learned, that, that we'll take them deep into our heart. Lord, I pray if there's somebody here today, and for the first time in their life they realize that they're on their probationary period, that after this is over, it's over. And if they die lost, they stay lost for eternity. There's no second chance. Father, I pray if the Spirit is moving this morning that that one would just simply receive Christ into his or her heart. They can do it right where they are in their seat. They can come forward. Somebody will be here to pray. Father, I ask that your will be done and your spirit move now among us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Matthew. They're going to begin to play. As they begin to play, I want you to contemplate this. We're all going to die. One day, one day our number will be called, our name will be called. One day we will have to face judgment. And in that judgment, We'll either be called a sinner or a saint. We'll either be accepted into heaven or cast into hell. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. Do you know where you'd go if today was the last day that you had on this earth? If you don't, you can get that settled. If you do know where you'd go, but maybe you have some questions. Or maybe you've been living questionably. Now is the day to get that right with God. Go ahead. First one is this lady needs our prayers for peace and for grace during this time. So I'd like to ask this church to pray for her. Okay, get to know her. I'm not going to tell you her name, but you should go ask her her name. But I work with her. I know her name. I hear her every day on the radio. Uh, but, but get around and get to know her. 
and ask and just pray for her. Don't ask her what it is unless she tells you. Pray for her. The second thing, George Berger would like to come and formally join our church. He's a saved man. He served under Junior Pittman, so we know he checks out. But uh, he would like to formally join our church. We've talked. He's in agreement to act right. So what I need is someone to make a motion to accept him. Mike, a whole bunch of people make motions to accept him to form a membership. Uh, in, all in favor? All right, get around, shake his hand, get to know him. He is in the chili cook-off, so he may be kicked out today as well as join the day. And have a seat. Um, we're about to have a baptism. Before we have that baptism, there's something that I'd like to say. I don't know if a lot of people know this. I officially became the pastor of this church in December of 2016. In October of 2016, I became the interim pastor here at the church. The reason we did that is we had to make sure that me and Mike and Lanny could get along. Because if we couldn't get along, one of us had to go, and it was me. So, but in 1964, and I wrote all this out because I get emotional when it comes to church. In 1964, the Lord moved Pastor Earl Jackson to break ground where we are. In the 1980s, the Lord moved Pastor Jackson to change the name from Mulberry Baptist Church to Calvary Baptist Church. And in 2013, the Lord moved Pastor Jackson uh, to retire as pastor of this church. In the beginning of 2016, the Lord brought me here right after the statement was made, God's not going to bring a pastor to our front door. That next week, I was here. Mike made that statement. <laughs> Mike was the first person I talked to here. Mike put me in his phone right away as Pastor Matt, not knowing what the Lord had in mind. For months, I helped this church find a pastor, and for months, the church's heart wasn't uh, settled. And then in October 2016, I became the interim pastor, and in December of that year, I fully took it on. Today is the beginning of the sixth year that I've been at Calvary. Me and my wife have only been married for seven years. Our marriage started the beginning years of our marriage. My wife's already gone, but she shared me with the church. She still shares me with the church. Because when I'm home, I'm here. God made a special woman when he makes a pastor's wife. And that is my wife. Who was here the first day? Miss Pam was. Lanny and Judy were. Miss Inez was. Mike and Ray Jean. Were you here? Deanna was here wasn't many of us. Jack Stapleton, one of the reasons I stayed. He's a wise man. We've seen people go, we've seen people come, but what we've seen here is something that doesn't happen every day. Most churches that are down to that few people die. They close their doors and they move on. We followed the vision that God has given me for the past five years and and we've done what everybody said couldn't be done on the ground that was broke back in 1964. We've knocked out a wall. Everybody's sitting back behind that pillar. That area wasn't there five years ago. We've had to knock out a wall. We're putting in um, some accommodations for parking. Um, we're, we're having to do a whole lot of things. And in 36 years, I've lived a lot of life and I've done a lot of things. But outside of my salvation, my wife, and my son, this has been the greatest honor of my life. I've seen a church revitalized from this side of the pulpit. I've got to witness miracles from this side of the pulpit. I've got to see a lot of things that most people will never see, and I've got to see them from back here. A few weeks ago, my wife asked me, and my mom was worried about it, so my wife was told, so my wife asked me, she said, Matt, are we leaving Calvary? She 
said, I'll follow you anywhere, but I'd like to at least know so I can pack a bag. <laughs> she said, you're restless, restless like I haven't seen you in years. The answer is no, I'm not leaving. If anybody had that question, didn't ask, I'm not leaving. The reason I'm restless is because now it's time to shift gears. And that makes me nervous. It makes me nervous because the status quo has to change. Everything we've done for the past five years has to be shaken up and redone. Uh, and, and we have to do it because we have a community that needs to hear the message that's proclaimed at Calvary. They're not going to hear it at the movie theater. They're not going to hear it at work most of the time. They're not going to hear it at the restaurant. The only place they will hear it is inside of God's churches. And we happen to be right in front of the entire town. We have to do it. As your pastor, I love you, I'll fight for you, I'll stand before God and plead for you. But in return, what I'm asking is that you plead for the lost souls of your families, that you plead for your neighbors, that you plead for your children, that you plead for your grandchildren, and that you go in front of God and you plead for them. Because the end is near. I've been hearing all my life, the end is near. Over and over again, I've heard it, and I've, I was one of them pessimistic, I mean, one of those uh, pessimistic people, like, oh, I've heard that my whole life. But listen to me, it's time. At any given moment, the eastern sky can open up, and God can call his church home. What happens to those people left behind? It's not like the movie with Nicolas Cage or Kirk Cameron. Not like any of that. It's going to be hell on earth. You're not going to see anyone living peaceably. There'll be souls saved. But we can reach them today. Church, I want you to know that this is home to me. Me and my wife probably wouldn't know how to be married outside of here. But God brought us here when we needed it. And God brought you here when you needed it. And we as a church, as we shift gears, you know, Jesus was called a friend of sinners. That's what the church is supposed to be. So in five years, you can fire me, okay? But for five more years, we have to be the church that's friends of sinners. We have to be the church that reaches out to the community and brings people in. Let's knock out another wall. Well, I don't know. It's not good acoustically. <laughs> and we have to get rid of that carpet. The kids like the carpet in the nursery more than they do the TV. But let's do something amazing. The only way we're going to do it, though, is we follow God. At this time, I'm going to ask Nicole to come forward. She's going to go back over here, and she's going to change. I'm going to go over here, and we're going to have a baptism. After the baptism, everybody's going to be dismissed. All the judges are going to have to go over first and get their blind taste test chili. Mandy's over there getting it all ready now. And then I want all of us to stay and celebrate. And then, tomorrow, get ready. Because everything's changing again. But it's okay. Now we go on the offensive. We've been rebuilding. We've been restructuring. Now we go on the offensive. And I firmly believe that in five years from now, we'll be having another one of these talks. You'll either be firing me, or we'll be saying, okay, five more years. Let's see what happens. They're going to sing.
Christmas. 